Hello and welcome to the Flip Classroom Online lecture part on hotel and lodging types. Um, I'm doing this method of on this topic partially because a number of you in this class or have or are going to be getting the same kind of information or at least a, a good part of it in 114. Others have not, so rather than duplicate the effort for everyone, we'll put it down so that you can listen to the parts that you may or may not know. And also, to take some of the more categorization type of things and put them into uh, an online lecture as opposed to taking class time for it, so we can use this to discuss and discuss issues that are more related to management. So let's begin. So we're going to talk about types of hotels, and I'm going to spend the recorded part of this on the types of hotels. I'll spend a very brief time talking about the unique hotel concepts because, again, a number of you have seen them, but there's a lot of links in there. You can do a lot of that on your own uh, in the process. So let's just talk about the, uh, the types of hotels in particular. So types. In the basic look at the lodging uh, hotel sector, we think about a range from a destination resort, and a destination resort being where, let's say you're on an island and you're the only property on that island, for example, or in that particular destination and people fly there just for that resort as opposed to having multiple resorts in a location. So if you were to think of a resort like Hawaii, for example, uh, Honolulu would not be a destination resort itself, but there are destination resorts on some of the islands such as uh, Lanai and others where there's really focused on maybe one resort in one area. So not resorts as a, so, as, a, as a type here, but destination resorts. Uh, moving down that continuum, we think of a full-service hotel. Full-service hotels, obviously, guest rooms are involved, but we have restaurants, probably meeting space, could be entertainment aspect, other things going on within that operation. So all the amenities that you need basically are there. Uh, Limited-service hotels, and on the other hand, are more along the lines of those that just have guest rooms. Uh, say, a Hampton Inn or a Fairfield Inn or something of that nature uh, would be a limited service hotel. Not to say that they might not have a restaurant nearby or even possibly connected, but it's usually not run by the hotel itself. It could be an outside in entity. It might be a, a Denny's, for example, or something of that nature that, uh, that happens to be there, but it's just basically a guest room aspect. And then we have sleeping rooms, okay, sleeping rooms, and we'll talk about this in some of the unique concepts that are coming out today in that area, but in one way to look at just sleeping rooms might be an Airbnb, for example, as part of the lodging sector, if you will. Now, what's the difference between these types of, of lodging facilities? These are all different categories, essentially three different ones. Uh, we're going to talk about in a minute the luxury upper, upper upscale, upscale, and so on, uh, and you're going to use that in the context of your hotel experience and the hotels that you're going to do for us and show us in terms of your videos. Uh, then you have the destination resorts, full service hotels, limited service hotels we just talked about. And then I add another category in here and say the extended stay or the all suite hotel. You know, extended stay uh, like a residence inn, for example, or an embassy suites is an all suite type of property. Being a little bit different than the others, but by extended stay here, we don't mean necessarily staying for months at a period of time. We're talking about maybe seven days or things of that nature where we stay a little longer in the process. And then over on the right side, you see boutique and lifestyle, bed and breakfast, uh, service departments, conference centers, vacation ownership. The first four of those we're going to talk about in more detail. Vacation ownership, we're not going to spend much time on that here uh, in this class, uh, but it is the timeshare elements, and many of the major brands are now in that field, including Hilton and Marriott. So these are examples here of the chain codes that STR, and we'll talk more about STR and STR Global as we go through this class, if you're not familiar with them at this point. These are some of the chains in the various categories here. Now, the hotels that you're going to do in your experience are not part of these brands, so you're going to have to determine based on what you know of these brands and looking at these brands, where do you think that property that you have fits? So in the luxury, we think about Intercontinentals, which is an IHG hotel, Shangri-La, my old hotel group, JW Marriott, and of course Ritz-Carlton are both part of 
uh, of Marriott, uh, Sofitel, part of a core, uh, Fairmont, uh, part of a core as well, Grand Hyatt, Four Seasons, Kempinski, Waldorf Astoria, part of Hilton, Vanden Oriental. Uh, we think of those. And then the upper scale, you have some of the same parent company brands in here with Hilton, Marriott, so on in the process of things. But you see where we're going from there down to the economy at the, uh, at the lower end. Now, some hotel groups, and Marriott is one, and this is a pre-Starwood merger aspect, look at trying to be in all segments uh, and also all types. And some of you have seen this. I've talked about this in 221 in a little different context. But Marriott took on a strategy, as you see here, uh, a few years back to say they were in the hotel business, they were in the extended stay, they were in the senior living, and they were in vacation ownership. And in each of those areas, they wanted to have a product that matched the quality level of the deluxe full service or limited service. So in the hotels, it was Ritz-Carlton, and of course now they have St. Regis involved in that too, and JW Marriott and so on. Then the full service hotels, such as Marriott's, and then the limited service, such as Fairfield Inn. Now those were all really existing products. And then they looked at their extended stay, where Residence Inn was the beginning for them, which was in the full service area. They created a partnership with a company called ExecuStay and created a, a higher end product there, and then also a lower end product in Spring Hill Suites. Going up to the top in vacation ownership, Marriott got into the vacation ownership at the full service level by acquiring a property in, uh, in uh, South Carolina, and then eventually built their first one at, in Orlando at the Marriott World Center where I was, in fact. And they looked there to say, well, let's have a luxury product there. So they have a rich Carlton vacation ownership aspect, and then they wanted a more limited service one horizons. They are also in the fourth category, the senior living area. Again, we're not going to talk about that in here, but they looked at taking that same level of branding. Uh, this is called product segmentation when we do something like this. We call this product segmentation. But that's one of the reasons why you see the growth of so many brands within these major companies. And we'll talk more about other reasons when we get to the development side. So let's talk about some of the various types. That's the primary purpose of this particular lecture. Uh, resort or destination resort, conference center, convention hotel, a boutique lifestyle hotel, bed and breakfast, uh, and the service department or alternative type accommodation. So let's start with talking about resorts. And I'm going to start by flipping this back to you. And this will be part of our discussion in class. And some of you have had this discussion before. So that's why it's sort of repetitious if we try and do it twice. So we'll try and do it a little differently this time. So what are the unique features and characteristics of a resort? Now, I'm not necessarily talking about a destination resort here. I'm just talking about any resort. It could be a resort in Pismo Beach. It could be uh, a resort in Hawaii. It could, be a, it could be a destination resort. You'll find this in the questionnaire. And if I didn't mention that in the beginning, there's a questionnaire associated with this flipped classroom that I want all of you to take, which will be part of our discussion in class. So what's a conference center? Let's talk about conference centers. And this is an important concept because a, a conference center here is not a convention center. We're talking about something smaller. Uh, these are usually facilities where you have strong educational focus of your meetings. So you know, maybe it's a corporate retreat to discuss some new strategy of things that you're doing and you need a real intensive aspect. Maybe it's an educational group that needs to meet and talk about the particular areas. Maybe it's a seminar or something and we want to have um, a dedication to the learning part of things. So conference centers sort of evolve from really almost like university classrooms to uh, to facilities where the, the meeting rooms themselves are not necessarily luxurious, although there's some luxury properties in this area, but they're very functional and they have a lot of the technology, they have a lot of the, the, um, the kind of equipment and so on that you want to have to run an effective meeting. So they're is an organization called the International Association of Conference Centers, and they live by the three L's. Uh, learning, so it's it's focused on that. That's a, a key element, that that's the primary issue. Living, because there's also guest rooms associated with it. And again, they're not necessarily luxury, and sometimes they're double occupancy and things of that nature. And then leisure, and leisure in this case may just simply be pool or outdoor recreation or something like that, but not a resort leisure as, as we usually think of it. 
So the facilities, the meeting rooms, they basically say no food in the meeting rooms. The meeting rooms are dedicated to food. So unlike the typical hotel where you turn a room over from have a lunch function to an afternoon function or something of that nature where you're doing a meeting later on, uh, they, they don't do food within the meeting rooms. And they, have, they don't have as many uh, divided, dividing rooms. They're more solid-walled rooms and facilities that are conference centers typically. But breaks are in a common area, so all groups that are meeting in that facility on that day all go to the same place or the same areas where their meetings are for their coffee breaks and so on. Uh, and then the services that are offered are a little more higher scale in terms of the type of AV equipment and the things that you might get there. Uh, the rooms are designed more for like lots of whiteboard space, uh, things of that nature. The, the chairs are typically more comfortable for longer aspects of things. That's the kind of thing you find in a conference facility. Here's some basic photos of it. The top uh, left-hand side, you see a uh, an open U type uh, setup for those of you who know that aspect of it. Again, you look at the comfortable chairs there. Uh, upper right side is a theater, is a uh, excuse me, a, a um, classroom style setup here in a much more elaborate aspect than you typically get in a hotel. The center picture is a fixed seat auditorium, and that's oftentimes you'll have a facility like that. That's where you can get a few more larger number of people in there. And then the bottom left hand picture is is a room, make it as, as you will in the process and put those tables together how you do in the process. It happens to be an open U, but you could do it in any aspect. Now, this is an interesting one because it does look like they have food there, and normally you wouldn't have food in a, in a convention center, or a conference center, excuse me, conference center. Okay, the opposite end of the spectrum, perhaps in terms of size and scope, are hotels as convention venues. And I want to talk about that unique aspect because I think that's a uh, an element that some of you may decide if you want to pursue your careers in the uh, in the hotel side of the events area. This is really where that where that option exists. Now, convention hotel chains in in North America, the, the convention hotel, I believe, started with Hilton. Hilton built a number of big hotels in cities like Chicago, New York, uh, Atlanta, places like that where they designed them to have a lot of meeting space. So they really were the founders and the start, started that element of big convention hotels. Now Sheraton followed along uh, in their days as Sheraton, they became Starwood, and now they're a part of Marriott too, but Sheraton was kind of side by side, especially in places like Washington DC where there were big hotels on both uh, fronts, Hilton and Sheraton competed a lot. Hyatt came along a little later with a little more modern, a little more um, upscale, actually, than the other two type properties, Chicago being one that they started with. Uh, they also had Atlanta. It was a big uh, growth for them. Uh, San Francisco. Uh, they had big hotels in major cities, and they do worldwide today. They have them in Asia. They have them uh, in, in particular in Asia, where they built a number of bigger hotels. I mean, not as, be as big as the ones in the U.S., but they're bigger hotels. Marriott got into this a little later in the mid 80s. I was fortunate to be with Marriott when we were developing that, you know, so I was on the ground floor of this. Today, a lot of people might think when you think of the beginnings of convention hotels, you might think of Marriott, but in the early days, Marriott was a corporate suburban hotel in an in a industrial park. Uh, that was basically where they were, or airports, uh, and they did a few airport locations like DC. But they later got into building bigger hotels, first in New Orleans and then Chicago, which is where I started my career. And Chicago was a bigger convention market than New Orleans. And so we really became sort of the model that, that uh, others grew from there. And with the acquisition they had a number of years ago now with Renaissance, they also have uh, convention hotels under the Renaissance brand. And then when you now lump in the Sheratons uh, with, and the Westons, for example, with the Starwood merger, they have a number of different brands that are in this market today. Fairmont is another. Now they started in selected hotels in selected cities. Fairmont was not a big name brand at the time. They began in San Francisco. They had the San Francisco property built in Dallas. They built in Chicago. Uh, they had other places where they uh, where they took hotels on, and then later they acquired the Canadian Pacific hotels, which were big convention type hotels in Canada, and grew from that perspective. We often call these hotels the big boxes. Uh, there are lots of rooms, usually 1,000 rooms or more. Uh, they have multiple ballrooms in many cases. Sometimes they have a dedicated exhibition hall or at least a facility where they can do exhibitions. Uh, 
Uh, where are they? Well, certainly Vegas is a big capital for big hotels and big ballrooms. And you see the Venetian Palacio combination, the MGM Grand, uh, the Mandalay Bay. You, you see a number of major uh, convention type facilities uh, as well as large number of rooms. Orlando was another, and I was fortunate to have opened the Marriott World Center there, which was one of those type of hotels. Chicago being the meeting city that it is, there are a number of big hotels there, and Atlanta. And now you see the growth of these big box uh, properties in Asia and the Middle East, uh, particularly you, you see them in Macau and Singapore, in Asia and in the Middle East in Dubai. Uh, there's a, the big growth of these type of facilities there. So who's doing this? Who's managing them in the process? Well, it's the global brands. It's, it's Hyatt Hilton Marriott. That, that's one of the primary uh, growth companies in those areas are the, the companies that have started these big hotels and they have the expertise in it. But you also have the gaming companies, Las Vegas Sands, as I mentioned, MGM, Wynn. Uh, they're all growing these bigger hotels with facilities that also have gaming uh, in places where that's allowed around the world, with Vegas being the, the center point. And then a, a unique one that has grown up here in North America that's now one of the Marriott brands, but Gaylord, which started in Nashville, have built more of a, um, well, almost a resort type of feel to the convention hotel, as opposed to a high-rise city hotel. They're, they're more of a, a spread out type of facility, which is their plus and their minus, if you will. So how does a convention hotel differ from a convention center as opposed to in a convention venue? That's a question we're going to talk about in class, and that's a part of the discussion items that uh, will come out of the questionnaire. So we'll talk more about that and think about that aspect of it. So hotels as convention venue characteristics, what do they have to have? They have to have big meeting space, guest rooms, and banquet and food functions. All under one roof. Leverage pricing on all elements because it's all being done in one place. That's a key element of why you use a convention hotel uh, for a venue, for example. Uh, you have decor and ambience as opposed to a convention center that maybe doesn't have that. So specifically built for meetings. Uh, brass, glass, marble, wall coverings, plush carpets, all those kind of things. Hotel companies are who you're dealing with as opposed to government management. Uh, oftentimes these convention centers are city government-owned, government-managed, and not necessarily profit-motive aspect, so the negotiation might be different there. Uh, convention center development is often tied to hotel development. You know, for a big convention center to be built in a city, there needs to be guest rooms associated with some place, and sometimes cities will build a convention center and fund a hotel and bring in a management company to run it, like Marriott or Hilton. Multiple current events and meetings can go on at the same time in, in a convention venue because of the different natures of guest rooms and functions that are there. Uh, and size, of course, you know, you, you have the, the advantage of having all of this under one roof and the size of everything in one place. So the role of hotels, you know, it varies depending on uh, the, the events that are being held, but uh, hotels could be when you've got a large convention going on in a city, for example, an Oracle World in San Francisco or an Apple Developers Conference or something of that nature, uh, could be accommodation and some meals. Okay, when all the activities are at a convention center, perhaps, or, or maybe even another big hotel. Uh, it could be accommodation meals and some seminar rooms, some separate kind of things where maybe a convention facility doesn't have that uh, same kind of capability or you want to have something more private. Could be facilities associated with receptions, banquets, support events, things that are happening while that conference is there where the you know, maybe the delegates go to the exhibition at the conventions and everything, they come back to the hotel for the other food functions and so on, so there's big revenue for a hotel there. Uh, or it could be inclusive uh, with conferences, meetings, all of everything under one roof, all there in one place, uh, which is ideal if you're a meeting organizer to find hotels that can do that. So... Why do hotels want meeting business? Now, let's answer that question. It's an important source of revenue because the food and beverage, in addition to the guest rooms, increases the value of the, the meetings that you have. Food and beverage is an important element there. Getting repeat business. Organizations that come back year after year on a regular basis, That's a, or at least rotate perhaps to other properties within the same brand, even if they're not in the same 
one each year to different cities. They may be there. Uh, meeting rooms can be used for a lot of different purposes. So there could be private parties and dances, and so revenue generates from that activity. Uh, being divisible and adaptable to serve several different types of functions. So you might have an exhibit hall, banquet halls, meeting rooms, reception areas, all those kind of things where you um, can bring in all different kinds of elements and different kinds of revenue sources, if you will. And the average spending of the uh, resident conference guest is higher than other market segments, so that's good. But ultimately, you want a balanced market mix because of economic cycles. Corporate business travelers, convention travelers, leisure travelers have different cycles, especially when economies go up and down. So we need to think about that. That's a, a key element in terms of uh, what we're dealing with. And so balancing it out by having this kind of convention activity makes for a better overall picture financially for a hotel. Now, the next two areas I'm going to talk about, the boutique and lifestyle and the bed and breakfast, I've done some research in these areas. And so part of what I'm presenting here is research I've done. Uh, boutique hotels and lifestyle hotels is a study that I did back a couple of years ago to try and differentiate them, looking at hotel owners and hotel management companies in terms of how they differentiated them. And what they said was a boutique hotel is typically a small hotel that offers high levels of service. Boutique hotels often are authentic cultural historic experiences uh, and interesting services to guests. Uh, boutique hotels are unique. Whereas a lifestyle hotel, and a lifestyle hotel uh, might be uh, a W hotel, for example, um, or uh, an Indigo hotel of uh, IHG, uh, their, their product. The, the lifestyle tends to be small, medium-sized hotels that provide innovative uh, features and service. So they tend to be more contemporary okay, in design, uh, and they're, but they're still highly personalized as opposed to larger hotels. So we differentiated those two in terms of what one is versus the other. Some more descriptive characteristics. You look at the boutique side. I'm not going to go into the details of this. That's part of what we'll do in our discussion aspect of it is you know, what do you think are the important elements within the boutique side? These are what the experts say differentiate them. And notice it doesn't necessarily say small. And then on the right side, you see the lifestyle. Okay, so more innovative, uh, less about the, the brand, more about personal, contemporary, modern. So there's, there's quite a bit of difference in the different concepts here. Both have a uh, similar nature, though, in that they tend to be smaller and not traditional where one is exactly the same as another. Now, switching gears to the hotel and the bed and breakfast differences, if you look at the, the bed and breakfast concepts that we think about, particularly those we think about in North America, this is a little graphic of what the Bed and Breakfast Association says makes them different. So homemade type breakfast as opposed to uh, a restaurant type meal, for example. Uh, bottled water in the room, although you see hotels doing that today in terms of what's there, but they typically are free, right? And Wi-Fi. Uh, again, are they or are they not charging? Not sure that's different in every place. Parking, okay, free. Usually with a bed and breakfast, there's there's a parking lot associated with it as opposed to especially city hotels in San Francisco paying $60, $70 a night to park. Uh, concierge, you know, in a hotel, you have a, a full service concierge department person in that role. In a bed and breakfast, the innkeeper is the concierge and knows the area and they're the local person. And they often have wine and cheese hours, again, uh, free. So that's what they say are their differences. Now, how much of that is still different today versus what they see today? More and more you see hotels trying to provide more experiences, right? And as they provide more experiences, they tend to go more into what the bed and breakfasts are. And if anything, bed and breakfasts see their biggest competitors today as the Airbnbs of the world and how they're doing similar kind of things, but maybe not all under one roof, for example. Now, this, these two pictures depict a study that I did in mainland China, looking at the concept of growing, whether it was feasible to grow bed and breakfast in mainland China. And what we did is we took a collage of pictures. We had the two different collages, and we went on the streets of Shanghai and Hong Kong, and we interviewed people with regards to what their preferences were and what they would call them and what, they would, what, they, uh, what, they were, what their preferences were, if you will, that they, where they would go. Now, the first collage up above is of the typical U.S.-based type of uh, bed and breakfast, European, also very similar in terms of what a bed and breakfast is. Uh, they 
in Asia, by the way, they, they would call this, they called this a, a homestay, interestingly enough, as opposed to a bed and breakfast. That was the concept that came out there. And the bottom is more of what might be called a cultural hotel in China, uh, which is small guest rooms, a uh, limited amount of uh, uh, no, no food and beverage except for maybe a breakfast aspect of it, but looking more at trying to be authentic within that area. Now we asked Chinese and we asked Westerners uh, which one they would prefer seeing in China. And I'll leave that for discussion, but the interesting aspect was that the Chinese felt the top type of facility was their choice. And Westerners thought the bottom one was more their choice. Interesting. Thinking about that in terms of what you might do if you were developing it in a market. Last concept I'm going to talk about here is service departments. I'm not going to show this video in the video. Uh, you can look at this video from Escott, one of the leaders in there, to get a little better idea of what a service department is. Service departments are typically long-stay guests. Now, I don't mean a week here, I mean 30 days, a year, whatever may be in a longer aspect. I've lived in a service department. I lived in a service department for five years when I was in Hong Kong. Uh, the leading brands in this area uh, are Escott, Oakwood, and Fraser's. Now, interestingly enough, Oakwood started in California, started in LA actually, uh, and they have a number of properties here. Uh, Escott and Fraser's and Oakwood, what do they all have in common today? Interestingly enough, they're all owned and headquartered in Singapore. Singapore is a huge central source for service departments. Not sure why that actually evolved, although Ascot is the largest and perhaps that was where they, they gravitated, but Oakwood is now also owned there. Looking at why people choose service departments, these are some of the, the various aspects you think. Brand recognition, okay, so they do go with those that they are familiar with. Uh, policy. Uh, complement and preferred supplier list. So the, they're talking about the company. The company authorizes them to stay there. In many cases, companies actually rent these and then bring people in, rotate them in. Sometimes the companies rent them for employees that are going to be there for a long time. Sometimes they rotate, pe pe rotate people through. Uh, you see traveler assignee preference. Okay, That's another element. That's what we're talking about there is the second. That's one in the, the bar in the middle in terms of why they, they send it. Cost is not necessarily one of the largest ones. Location, well, location, they tend to be in good locations, but they don't necessarily have to be in the location where the offices are, although that would certainly be convenient. So how is a managed service department different from a traditional city hotel? Again, this is going to be part of the flipped classroom aspect coming from the questionnaire. Now, the next aspect here, the unique concepts, I'm just going to go very quickly through this. I'm not going to spend much time on this because we're going to talk about this in class, uh, but I'll let you go through them on your own. A number of you have already seen these before, so I'm not going to do a lot of repetition, but just say that you have the brands that are trying to attract your generation, uh, Gen X, Gen Z, uh, the, the Moxies from the Marriott's, the Joe and Joe's from Accor. You can find out a little more about them. Yotel, I will talk about this in class a little bit in terms of its unique concepts and my experience with the one uh, in Singapore, if you haven't heard me already speak about it before. Uh, the Now Hotel in Pattaya, Thailand, which is actually owned by a former student of mine from San Francisco State, has a similar type concept to some of these others. This one is a resort type uh, location, though. Uh, some unique kind of things like the, the tub at the end of the bed, for example, you see there. A uh, great hotel. Graduate hotels, again, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but they're developing them in college towns from former holiday inns and quality inns and so on. I'll let you look at this video of the Robot Hotel. We'll talk a little bit more about the fact that uh, Hana Hotels uh, is now doing less robots, and this experience, if you listen to it, will maybe tell you why. Uh, take a look at this one. This is an automated hotel now in the Alibaba Flying Zoo Hotel. Uh, and the Space Pod Hotel. And I want to know what you think about this one. And not space pod, but space. And you can go out into space for only $9.2 million. Uh, you can put $80,000 now and you can possibly go out here uh, in terms of spending time in space, uh, in terms of what's com coming soon and sooner than we think uh, in terms of the future here of a space hotel. 
This is a list here of some uh, the best new concepts and unique concepts. Uh, I, I have you go and take a look at this, uh, and we can have a, a general discussion about this afterwards. So in summary, in the type aspect of it, uh, how would you categorize a hotel? That's a, a key element. How would you categorize a hotel? You're going to do that with your projects. And then what's new on the horizon? What do you think? That's what we'll discuss. Okay. Hope you enjoyed that, and we'll talk more about it in class.